Welcome to Creative Block, we're your host, V. And Sean, we interview people in the creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We asked people on our social medias if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. Today, we have with us Stephen Neary. Welcome Hi. on in. Oh. I'm Hi. opening the little door. I'm opening the little oh. door. I'm inviting hey. you into our house. <laughs> so welcome it's on in. Come there. on in. It's rainy out there. You're soaking wet. Here's a blow dryer. <laughs> you know, this is like a complete improv podcast. It's, all of a sudden. No, it's yeah, really, I was going to say, like, it's really cozy you into in here. An, <laughs> you it. an, an improv show, Stephen. <laughs> I run um, warm. That's fine. Sorry. I, we don't need a furnace as long as I'm here. Yes, and. Yes, and. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, happy uh, to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steven. Thanks, thanks, V. Thanks um, so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, S Steven, you're, you're like, um, you're so talented because you've done it all. You do comics in your free time. You've been a storyboard artist in feature, and you've worked in TV also for a long time um, as a supervising director, showrunner, creator, and all that. And so, like, this is such an impressive career. When did you, when you considered a career into the arts did uh -huh. you set out to be a showrunner <laughs> oh gosh no not at all no it was it was kind of by accident i think and i feel very, really lucky that i've been able to do this um i grew up in indiana and i i never knew anybody who worked in animation or all i knew about animation was like watching those featurettes before like disney movies and I, I knew that I couldn't draw like Glenn Keane. So it's like, what's the point really of like, don't draw too much. But I loved like making little movies. And I grew up kind of at the dawn of the iMac and iMovie and everything. And just feel really lucky that I got to um, make, yeah, little little movies on my computer and stuff at home. So I, I went to NYU to study live action, actually. Oh, really and, cool. And then it was really cool to move to New York City um, but everybody there was kind of making these really expensive, like $40,000 student films. And I was like, I, I don't want to, that's terrifying. I want to have a job when I graduate and, you know, no shade to live action, but it's just a real, it's a real grind. But I knew working in animation, I could kind of start right away. So that's kind of how I fell into animation, just doing storyboards for a lot of people's student shorts. And, um, yeah, I, I sort of started working while I was in college. I, I knew After Effects pretty well from high school, and I got jobs doing, like, compositing for, like, SNL TV Funhouse and, um, you know, like, puppet animation for stuff like the Wonder Pets, these, which, if you don't know what the Wonder Pets is, they're, they're baby animals that save other baby animals, and it's a musical. And those were, like, summer jobs where I'd try and stack all my classes, so I had you know, class on one day and kind of work on another day. And um, yeah, I just feel really lucky that I got to kind of keep working um, through school, which was cool. So you were already working as you were in school, like while you were in school and you were already working in animation pretty much, right? Since you were doing... Uh... Yeah, it was just kind of this this little New York scene where there was always a lot of work going around and you, it was kind of a hustle, but I didn't know it was at the height of the financial crisis. I didn't know that it was actually a really bad time for animation. It was horrible, apparently, and um, until now, I guess that was kind of the last, <laughs> the last um, bad time. But uh, yeah, I, I was just really fortunate. I feel like, and then um, I always wanted to be a little bit closer to like the writing side of it. So I was lucky enough to get an internship at Blue Sky Studios. Oh, doing cool. storyboards and that's kind of how i i started storyboarding a lot did you when you applied for the internship did you use all of the work that you did for the other students films to kind of put together a portfolio no um, um no it was all really bad work i was <laughs> really bad at storyboards i was terrible at it i couldn't I couldn't do it. I had to do all new. I had made, you know, student films. I would make a, a film every year and I would just kind of use After Effects. And I always thought maybe I'll make music videos or something. Um, but it was just always about like making the story and making the film. So I think a lot of my, my student shorts, I didn't even storyboard. And then I would go back and storyboard them later once I knew what the story was. So I could like use them in my portfolio. Um, so it was really That's the so wrong way to do it. Definitely. <laughs> 
that's so funny you're doing it like the art of books you're like let's just make the movie and then eventually we'll make <laughs> yeah it's 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 really silly it's not the way to do it at all so i i put a portfolio together for for blue sky and they said you know these these two guys rafael zentiel and moroni called me up and they were like hey um what's up with you man like you got some weird ideas um <laughs> Remember the thing in my portfolio that, that they really liked? It was like a paddle boat that I had drawn. And it was kind of the silhouette of like a face just sticking out of the water like that. And you could like sit, you know, on the lips and then your, ah. your feet would go <laughs> in the like nostrils. In the nostrils. And there would be oh like a, some sort of paddle boat mechanism in here that would like, you know, power a propeller. And I would just put these things into my portfolio, and they were like, "What are you? What are you doing? <laughs> you I you'd be in trouble if that thing sneezed. <laughs> you feel like yes, it's an eject totally, button. <laughs> totally. Um, if you put a tube in the nostril, to <laughs> yeah, it's don't put this in your portfolio. There's, 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 there's watching... like a little, there's a little sign that says uh, "must wash feet" before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it, you know. yes, please. Yeah, please. Um, it's no, really no funny. Shoes allowed. It's like. You had these little like Da Vinci ass conventions in your, like on on separate pages and on top yeah. of the storyboard. It's just sort of at the end, and I mean, I we we were just always drawing weird inventions in college. Like um, this kind of turned into a a Clarence episode later, but this idea of the pumpkin portal that it's like mm. just a pumpkin with two holes, and you just like look into it and look at the other person, and uh, just work your work your stuff out together by staring at each other. Um, <laughs> stuff like that. So they said, you can't draw, but we really like your ideas. So just come to this internship and try it out and you better learn how to draw. Or we're going to fire you <laughs> pretty much. Because um, That's what I was going to uh, ask you because you, you didn't like uh, learn, like you didn't get classical training in school for drawing, right? Or... Yeah, I mean, I took figure drawing. I would try to go once I was working at Blue Sky. I really went pretty religiously, like every weekend, to figure drawing for for mm. years, just to try and get better. I think mm. I think the problem was always how to um, make sure you could draw your ideas in a way that people understood them, because mm -hmm. if if there's a gap between your drawing ability and and your ideas, then people are just never going to understand your ideas or. You know, you can have a great joke, but if you can't put it in a storyboard and, and stage it well, then nobody's ever going to laugh at it or it's not going to get cut or be be edited in correctly. I don't know if all that makes sense, but um, I would just draw so much. And my, my first job was Ice Age 3 and they just kind of forgot I was an intern and I would wake up at night like drawing. My hand would be moving. And um, it was really cool to kind of go through that sort of boot camp um, and learn more about storyboarding i wish i could um, draw when i was asleep like oh and just gosh. go to sleep and like my my body just kind of does it and i don't have to think about it i mean i don't know <laughs> i don't know what kind of drawings you would do in your sleep but <laughs> really um it sounds a little bit like a capitalist dream like i want to be productive all yeah the time. all that downtime i really gotta monetize it you know it's, it's a waste <laughs> No, I'm all for it. I, I do have a little notebook next to me before I go to sleep, and I try to just do some doodles before bedtime. It's really relaxing sometimes. Oh, do you... It's a good idea. When you doodle, are you more of like an idea doodler, or are you just kind of like... uh Is, is it more like a stretch, like you're loosening your hand muscles? Like, is it like... Are, are you using your brain more or your hand more? Um, I think... <laughs> Uh, none of the above, I think. I think neither brain nor hand. No, just kind of. <laughs> I think I used to be a little more precious about my sketchbooks, and now it's it's just kind of like you know, it just feels really nice to have a pencil and run it across a piece of paper, and maybe that'll spark something, and maybe it won't. But that's kind of the the important part to um to me, maybe. But uh, yeah, depends funny. if I'm going to show somebody or not, I guess. Mm. But I'm guessing if it's before bad you're it's mostly for yourself right yeah yeah it's just um i really i really like drawing i know that sometimes because we all draw for a living it can really mm. 
kind of kind of get a little painful sometimes to think that you have to be productive. But I think one of the things, especially since the fungies ended, that's been important for me is just to kind of fall in love with drawing again and just get back to doodling whatever and not have it be tied to producing something in particular. Now, that's something that I, I find really interesting. I don't know if I've ever, ever had an opportunity to ask someone this, but um, uh, when you create a show and then the show is done, I always wonder sort of like what the mental process is going at, at the end of that is, is is there a morning a morning period where you're not really drawing very much is there like when did you find yourself able to think about other things and and think about like okay well, like what is what's next what what am i doing next that kind of thing yeah i mean i think i'm still um no figuring it out gosh i don't know it just um i think it was really nice to take some time off it was a pretty um fungies was a pretty intense production at times, but sometimes really relaxed. Um, I was supervising producer on this show, Clarence, which um, had all these amazing people working on it, like Spencer Rothbell, um, who really had a voice to it. But the whole time I was also kind of had this other project in development called The Fancies that turned into The Fungies. And it was in development for about five years kind of off and on oh, wow yeah. and then once we started making them we right away made 80 episodes in three years and and two of those years were during the pandemic so it was really intense it was kind of like my life for a long time and it has been really nice to just take a step back from that and um i think you can put so much focus into one goal and then you can kind of lose track of like oh i there's there's a lot of chances to make more stuff in the future. Mm -hmm. It's not just this one thing. There's going to be, you know, so many more ideas. This is hopefully not about just a project. It's about like having a long and, and fruitful career, hopefully. And um, yeah, so it's been really nice to get back kind of nice. into storyboarding and, and features and just draw more, you know. You don't always get Tactile, to draw much yeah, as yeah. a showrunner. Yeah. Well, what was, um, what was it like getting going from fancies to the fungies like like what's that development process like like how, how did how did that come about because that sounds like a journey already like like when people think about pitching they're like you know are, are, are the is the man gonna try to change the name of my show like how much you know <laughs> and obviously some things change so how did how did no, that the, go how's the development not the man the kids will change the name of, no kids i think it, what it was is they <laughs> they tested the shorts and i think kids were confused why the fancies weren't didn't have bow ties actually um, oh interesting yeah they funny. weren't fancy enough uh but i th i think that's all kind of indicative of where cartoon network was at the time when I, when i was pitching you know they were hot off the success of adventure time and steven universe and all these shows where they had really given creators kind of free reign to explore some really cool stuff. And then you put that on TV and eventually it's going to catch on because kids are watching it. So I think that's kind of where the fancies started. But um, around that time, I know also during development, sort of cable viewership started to decline as streamers took over. So I think there was more pressure on a lot of people to deliver a hit that was maybe impossible given the decline in viewership overall for cable channels. So I think everybody, you know, just wants to make sure that their money's protected. And that means, um, kind of, um, yeah, being very careful, which, which I understand because you can't make a cartoon without the people in charge. So yeah, it just took a while to figure out for them, you know, they, they just didn't want the cartoon to be too weird, I guess, you know, <laughs> which makes sense. It's a weird cartoon. It's a, it's a cartoon about little mushroom people. And I thought, you know, to me, it made sense. It was like the cartoons I grew up with on Saturday morning, like the yeah. popples or the noozles or the wuzzles or, you know, mm. all these shows that are just kind of almost in between like Batman and turtles and the really cool shows um, that I really gravitated towards that I really loved or like PBS shows like Arthur and stuff that are just kind of soothing and you have them on in the background. Mm -hmm. And I would say in terms of um, where we are now for cartoons, like that's just a little too out there. You, you know, you need a, a hook that's going to draw people in. 
and you need um you need that plot that's going to drive people towards like the next episode when you're streaming so i think by the time the fungies came out that sort of show like slice of life that you would watch on a saturday morning has really kind of evaporated and you know i don't i don't blame anybody for that that's just stuff out of your control so i'm really happy i got to make um the fungies it was great and it ran really smoothly and um yeah it was a dream come true that's so cool i feel like that's so cool that you just you kind of like followed this path into animation and ended up like getting a show that's like you know like so many people like dream of that so it's like it was such a cool way that your career went um how was how was kind of like the the pitching process like in details like the nitty-gritty of it i kind of like to ask that you know like did did you get an email one day from cartoon network and were they like hey steven do you have any ideas for us or did you uh or were you like proactive in that you pitch it as yeah. a comic a bible yeah oh yeah. gosh i wish i wish i um had thought of any of those things i didn't know really what i was doing <laughs> i i just kept making shorts every year when i was at blue sky i had a really long commute and um i ended up making this short on the train because it was like two wow. hours each way wait so you were spending four hours on the train every day yeah it's because they moved the studio to connecticut and i lived in oh. brooklyn wow. so i would i would um oh a lot of people would commute you know but i it was so cool and i wanted to live in new york city i didn't want to like live in <laughs> connecticut you know but um so i just kept making shorts on the train and um this short i made got into sundance and then i think i thought for some reason, I could just be like Don Hertzfeld and make shorts forever, but that's not really how that was only one Don Hertzfeld, you know, or, and, or those, all those people, you know, who, who do amazingly well on the film festival circuit. But it led to me getting representation and realizing, you know, really what they're doing at Cartoon Network right now is just making a bunch of cool shorts every week, week after week with the same characters. So maybe I should try and go do that. But I had a short in development at Blue Sky called Umbrella Corn that I ended up kind of animating myself that they never released. And then Cartoon Network sort of called to maybe get me on clearance at the same time I was developing some other stuff for them. So I think I I boarded like two other show ideas for them, one that was from a writer and then one that was kind of based on a student short that I made before they um, just gave me like one more chance to to um, pitch what became the fungies. But I'd, I'd pitched a lot of stuff. I would kind of try and fly out to LA once a year and sleep on friends' couches. And I think I pitched a show called like Dolphin Book Club and a show oh. that was like only about trees. And you just like learn every pitch kind of. It's a, it's just like a, uh, something you have to practice kind of over and over again. And you got to um, go through a lot of <laughs> stinkers sometimes. Can, can you elaborate show only about trees? it was called trees, now, now, I'm thinking, you know, now i'm just thinking and, about uh, that it's like it's great you got yeah you got all the different trees talking you know the park <laughs> rangers that take care of them the, um i remember pitching dolphin book club to this exec and he was like my son would so never cute. watch this um, really? he was like i might but my son would never so just and i was like oh okay well thanks oh, well Could is it the books oh i just love that name though dolphin book club it's like they kind of like swim underwater but also they're a little nerdy <laughs> um exactly it, it writes itself but um no but it's just one of these things you got to practice kind of getting out there and pitching yeah. before um you know kind of what people are gonna gonna respond to i guess yeah yeah, I, I was wondering whether it was because books would get wet underwater and they were like, and then Kindles aren't going to work underwater either, so it's not believable. It's, or... I mean, <laughs> that's, I that's a that. very smart analysis. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. Yeah, what do I know about dolphins anyway, really, or books? But uh, it it was really fun to, um, I think, to pitch the fancies first off. I just was, was really excited about kind of setting the tone for the show, and I, I think that really carries over into the final show as well. Um, but I remember the kind of feedback I was getting was just like, we don't, we don't really understand this completely, but we can tell you're really excited about it. So let's, to their credit, you know, they gave me um, so much freedom to kind of make the show 
that that I wanted to make, which was cool. And that's for the fungies? Yeah, for the fungies. Yes, correct. Oh, uh, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, I, I do feel like I do feel like Cartoon Network has a very creator driven approach and they're the more willing to take risks yeah. out of like all of the networks out there or like studios from from my uh, personal observations. <laughs> yeah, and I mean there's always it's always changing. There's execs leaving one place and going to another place. So you, you just never know, but it's all, it's all people, you know, it's all, it's all just people. Uh, a lot of the times when you first go in and you're pitching and, um, and your ideas are wild, a lot of times the notes from execs are uh, usually about grounding the show in, in, in some way. I'm curious uh, uh, if you can remember any like initial notes that were helpful maybe to steering you in a in in a direction that was you know like you're this wild unbridled source of ideas like is there anything that you found helpful <laughs> that uh during development yeah i mean definitely you know making a show is sort of like trying to construct the engine of a car and you want it kind of whatever the episode is going to be, the engine isn't really going to change to like the structure of the show. I mean, you can kind of depart mm -hmm. from that and experiment, which is really cool too, which we definitely did a lot of on Clarence, but you want to just make sure you kind of hit all, play all the hits a little bit. And I think just figuring out the structure of the fungies where there was this really excited mm -hmm. character, Seth, who, who through his own enthusiasm kind of made some selfish decisions and then sort of, in an almost um, parodying way of like the the lessons we had to learn watching cartoons as a kid, he will sort of come to terms with that and then apologize and then like make it right in a really cool way. Um, and it just took a while to figure out what that that conflict was going to be that would drive the story. So yeah, I, I'd say that was the tough part. I wish I could think of a more specific thing, really, but no, that's great. Yeah, we just kept on writing episodes and eventually. They they let us make a show, I guess. <laughs> that is so cool. I was also going to ask you, in the timeline, was the timeline that you were helping out on Clarence first and then you did the fungies? Um, or were they kind of like happening a little bit both simultaneously? Or in uh, kind of how did you get to supervise on Clarence? So that's a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Let me yeah. know if you want me to like count. Yeah, I think, you know, from working at Blue Sky, I just got really used to the structure where I would kind of do my my own thing in my my own free time. And then um, you know, for work I would just kind of try and do my job and get better at drawing and get better at the craft side of things. So I would say um that's kind of how I've always treated development also is like, I'm going to have my day job working on Clarence. And then in my free time, I'm going to kind of take those craft lessons I've learned and apply them to trying to make this show. So yeah, it was in, I mean, a lot of people at the time were getting these shorts on the side while they worked on, on, you know, regular show and adventure time. There was just kind of this whole development team that would reach out to artists and just ask them if they had any ideas. And that's where, all their new shows came from. So um, it's it's something that's always kind of going on in the background. And then, yeah, I think mm. I think for the fancies originally, they wanted a full pilot, but then YouTube kind of shorts got big. So they wanted to try and split the pilot into four episodes, but then, they're, then they become shorts, which is kind of something different, but then they kind of ended up on YouTube altogether anyway. So I think there were a lot of questions about the... Um, the format. Hey, hey, Robin. Hey, Dad is in a Dad is doing a podcast right now. Do you want to say anything? Do you want to say hi? Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hello. Here we gotta go, honey. All right. Say good night. Good to see you. I love you. <laughs> He's so cute. He wants Mario. I don't know. He just loves Mario right now. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think we we're just talking about development. It just, it just went on for a while. I don't know if it's really um, like a uh, good story necessarily. <laughs> just, just, you know, it always takes longer than you think it's going to take. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it, it, I mean, it's, it's really cool to hear that, like, you know, you, you were pitching so much too that like you had all these ideas that you were trying out before you uh, landed on fancies and then even fancies became fungies. So it's like really like a cool overview of like how much a project can kind of like morph and evolve and like how much like pitches you have to do prior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just got to keep, you just got to keep going, I guess. In in my experience. Um, yeah. It's, it's Did you miss the train? Did you miss like, <laughs> like how are you able to switch your working scenario over from making shorts on the train to, to having uh, a, you know, a workspace with no bumps. Was it weird? Was it challenging? Uh, totally weird. Not at all challenging. It's great. It's the best to not be working on a train. <laughs> Preferable actually. actually. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's nice just to, to be able to sit there and just, you know, it's so easy to get distracted nowadays with our smartphones and stuff, but I just, I didn't even have one of yep. those for a long time. There was just the train, the endless train. So um, it was kind of like read a book or work on your short. What are you going to do? But I do, in a weird like Stockholm <laughs> syndrome kind of way, miss riding the train and being forced to like work on stuff. Ah, yeah, that's crazy. But I mean, even then, even then, you need like what's the word? Like it was like you you were very disciplined because I feel like I've been on the train going from downtown to Sony for a while, and that was like almost an hour of commute oh, yeah, where I didn't have to. Dude. No, but what I'm saying I is that too. I wasn't disciplined like Steven. I Listen. was just kind of like doodling on my phone. Well, like it's not because you're in a train that you're going to be working. You know what I mean? I mean? You're probably happier for it, V, I think. I think it's, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Cause, cause I don't know. I, okay. Well, it's funny that you bring that up. What, like, what is creating like for you? Is it something that you feel like you have to do? Is it something that you enjoy doing? Like what's your relationship to creating, I guess? Um, yeah, I think it's something that I probably have to do and I'm really, and it's too late to change jobs now. So I should keep doing it maybe before, <laughs> you know, before AI gets here in a really scary way. Um, I, <laughs> Yeah, I just love it. I love the feeling of like being a kid in elementary school and having like a school project and like staying up all night to work on it. And then, you know, I think anytime you get to sh work on a storyboard for like two weeks and then show it to somebody, it's kind of like the best um, combination of like stand up comedy and I don't know, PowerPoint presentation or something. It's like, it's like getting to take a <laughs> test and you have the answers to all the, all the questions right in front of you. And you just um, try and make people laugh. It's really fun. I love that. I love that comparison. Have you ever been a performer? Like, have you ever done like improv or stand up or anything? Or have you always kind of like, I guess, uh, hidden behind the drawings? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's definitely better. Hiding behind drawings is, yeah, I think is, is really healthy. No, um, I was, <laughs> what was I? I was in... I grew up and kind of my dad did a lot of commercials and he would put me in commercials sometimes. And I was on like the speech team in high school, just some really nerdy stuff. So I, I kind of got comfortable with public speaking. And then I, I think spent, a, you know, 10 years in a room alone drawing and then got uncomfortable again with public speaking. But <laughs> I, um, I very much like, you know, telling stories and that's a big part of, um, yeah, my family and how we talk to each other. It's just a lot of um, family mythologies and like whoppers that go around and stuff. So, do you have a favorite yeah, speech um, that you gave? A favorite speech? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, what, what was there one? There was one that I I did by this author Robert Robert Olin Butler, I think, and he um, he made this series of short stories about um, sort of tabloid headlines, and then he would take the tabloid headline and write a very serious short story about it. So there's this one like jealous <laughs> lover returns in the form of parrot. And that was the, that was the headline to, you know, this like supermarket checkout lane kind of tabloid. And then okay. the, the author wrote this story about it that was kind of really sad and heartbreaking about this man who, you know, gets reincarnated as a parrot and then his ex-wife buys him and <laughs> she, he has to see her with this new man and he can't do anything about it. His, his vocabulary is so limited. He can only say things like, 
peanut, but you know, somehow he manages <laughs> wow. to communicate so much at the same time. And I I think I always gravitate towards stuff like that that's kind of weird, but then you take it very seriously and you kind of find the the humanity in it a little bit to It feels very Kafka <laughs> like that. <laughs> I like I like to I like to imagine being a being on a, a show run by you and just every day <laughs> You come out, and I have something to say on the subject of drawings and what makes a good drawing. And like, it's like, um, oh, he's giving a speech again. He did a uh, he's he does he does speeches. He's good at thank speeches. You. Let's go. Thank you, Sean. I can one hundred percent guarantee you that was nobody's experience on the fungies. But thank you. <laughs> it's nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um. But yeah, storyboarding is so fun. I, I don't know what to say. That's like the headlines is like, I'm still thinking about the tabloid headlines. I think that is so interesting and funny. It's also funny because it's something that in all the different like school, um, art school entrance exams in, in France, like one of the exam like tests was something like this, which was like, oh, uh, do a, like do an art project based off a headline from the press somewhere and it's goes to show yeah there's like so much that you can riff uh from in like the press and like current events but also tabloids tabloids are it's so interesting to you i don't know i just think it's a it was a really wait. interesting story i would wait until there was an article about spongebob <laughs> and then i would just make spongebob Oh, that'd be so nice. I'd love to read more about SpongeBob. <laughs> I want to read more SpongeBob articles. You mentioned like earlier in I forget if it if it was in the podcast or before we started the podcast, but like how when Fungies ended and you're trying to kind of like reconcile with like drawing and creating and all that, how did kind of comics come into your creative process? Like, was it something that was directly linked to? Fungi's ending or was it just like you trying out a new art form like how was yeah that that's a great question um yeah i just i remember being at blue sky and everybody in storyboarding was so hot on live action film and what was the latest live action film that, that came out and then i came to cartoon network and comics was really the thing that people were really passionate about and i i just didn't know a lot about comics and i think because i was working on clarence and the and the fungies pilots at the at the same time, I didn't have a lot of creative energy, so it was easier to just kind of write down stuff in my life that was happening, and to, you know, once you write down something, how do you present it in a way? Instagram is really interesting because it's almost like a storyboard panel, and you're doing the pitching yourself as you read. So hmm. I thought it was a really cool format, and um, even if you, you know, take one line of dialogue how you can kind of split it up among the the different panels to me is really interesting just for the the maximum impact or you know where you want the punchline to be all that stuff is is really fun so i usually um and then i knew if it was my own life that i wouldn't feel that pressure to kind of like turn it into something or mm. turn it into a series or it was just kind of a playground where i could show stuff that was that was 100% like what what i made what I wanted to make and then just see what people's reactions were. So it, it took a while to kind of find a style and find um, a language that, that felt right, I guess. Yeah. I love that. What you mentioned about each um, panel being each like slide being like a storyboard panel um, on Instagram. It, it, it really feels it. Yeah. It, it does feel like this is how you can pace your, comics like generally do you when you draw your comics do you draw them with the instagram format in your head or do you draw them for your page on your because they're all traditional drawings right it looks like they're all watercolor yeah they're all they're all watercolor and pencil so i i do think of them primarily for instagram i think mm -hmm. i've i've put some on twitter but um yeah that's just Instagram is kind of fun. You can put little videos in, you can put um, animation in, and I I like that that's what it is. Um, sometimes when you write, read the, uh, the comics just on one page, it almost, I feel like it doesn't take enough time to read it or 
Um, yes. It's really cool to be able to control like the pacing. I don't know if you feel that way in your in your comics fee when you're it, adapting them for Instagram. It's so weird because for my comic, I do try to make them a page because eventually one day I want to release it all as one book, but I do pace it in my head like a storyboard, but I also have to paste the rhythm per page so i know i gotta mm-hmm. end each page on sort of either a joke or a cliffhanger so like the rhythm is always dictated by the number of panels that can be on a page and i know that it can be any number of panels between one to ideally seven is the maximum is me pushing it six is usually the best number of yeah. panels. yeah yeah no, that's fascinating. That's like so you're doing it like two two jobs at once almost. Like how's this gonna look? Yeah. Yeah. But but I feel like Instagram works fine for me because I can just, you know, cut out the panels and then put them on the square. So I'm yeah. not like Instagram isn't limiting in a way. Uh for me it's like I think of the page more than I think of Instagram, I guess. Um, that yeah that sounds really healthy i mean i don't i don't <laughs> know um yeah i'm not sure it just seems like oh a lot more people will see this on instagram than they will see it like in a drawer in in my shed <laughs> you know which is where it is sitting <laughs> currently i have say, i have the opposite <laughs> problem people are flocking to this drawer in my shed and i, and I don't yeah, even have anything actually in there really... <laughs> Oh no, they're not people, they're ants. And this drawer is full of sugar. That's just a sugar drawer. A sugar drawer! <laughs> Get out of there. That's mine. Well, I, I'm I'm curious about your relationship with uh writing, because I'm assuming that I, I don't know how much writing that you did before the fungies and and I, I don't know how much you continue to how, how much you continue to do or how much you consider um yourself writing when you do comics or if it's mainly uh pit, you know drawing forward or something um but yeah I'm, I'm curious about your relationship with writing and and how you've worked that into you know your drawings and your process yeah i mean writing is really interesting because you know if you're a storyboard artist you're like you're a board artist you're a cinematographer you're kind of an actor you're a writer you're doing everything that's hard at the same time but I do think writing just by itself is really hard too. And I think it's it's almost easier for people to understand because it's just one thing versus storyboarding that's so many different things. So um, I think it's hard for artists to get into writing because you spend so much time writing and drawing at the same time. So just working on a TV show through the, the sheer amount of... Um, the sheer volume of work that you have to produce, you know, if you're going to produce 80... 80 episodes, that's, you know, four pages in outline. That's, that's a lot of writing. And um, it became clear to me that it was going to be really important to develop a practice of writing that was kind of separate from drawing. So I, I try to keep that up. And um, I think it's just one of those things you got to work at, like everything else, it's not going to, it's not going to happen by accident that you're good at writing. Mm-hmm. I think in episodic television, that just means like, okay, here's this really weird idea. How can we present that as clearly as possible in the writing so that everybody can get on board and enjoy like how weird or specific or heartfelt this, this particular scene is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I am so happy that you mentioned how storyboards is so many jobs at the same time. I feel like (laughs) this is my little soapbox moment where I'm like, Storyboarding is really hard, you guys. Uh. <laughs> it takes a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of drawings. Help. But I, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of drawing, but I think you pointed out something that's also yeah. like so true to storyboarding. is like you're doing so much and making so many decisions because it's not just the writing. It's not just the drawing. It's also like the directing and like the cuts and the editing and like the pacing. It's like so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of decision making. Um, yeah, I think, I think too, as a board artist, you have a tendency also to kind of overpose stuff and cram in more. I know I do, cause it's just, it's becoming animation at this point, but you know, as a director or writer, it's always like, how do I pull ideas out? How do I make this as simple and as clear as possible sometimes? 
Yeah, what's your, um, you're talking about like having a writing practice to kind of like stretch that muscle a little bit. What do you do to practice writing? Like, like just specifically that art form? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's where the comics are really helpful. I, I probably write one every day and then I just kind of think about how to split it up with the panels before I even draw it. And that's, that's a really fun practice to have. And then just kind of maybe at the end of a week, pick one. Um, I'm, I'm way behind on, on my comics, but, um, yeah, just, you know, keeping a computer with a million text files on it with ideas, um, you know, and you might not, you might not ever look at them again, but it's a good place to kind of frame your ideas and, and maybe you remember one later and you can go back and, and see if there's something there. So yeah, just, just, um, just do it. Just write, I guess. Oh, uh, what's your specific writing style? Are you, are you more of like a bullet point kind of guy or do you write in prose? Like what, how would you describe your writing style? Like, do you write scenes or do you just write concepts? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's more about Yeah, like writing writing scenes, like writing what you would get in a, a thumbnail image of a storyboard. Mm. And then I work on, you know, I, since kind of going back to feature drawing, um, feature storyboarding, there's a lot of kind of looking at the entire movie and trying to figure out, you know, where you could kind of, you know, edit this here and change this around here to maybe, I, I think as board artists, you're always kind of constructing this version of the movie in your head alongside the director and you're just trying to communicate with each other and see where those things sync up. So anytime you can just even watch a movie and write down your thoughts about it, I think is really helpful. Even just, yeah, talking about movies with other people and seeing, just asking specific questions, not really whether it was good or bad, but, but you know, what, what about this film resonated with you? What about this film really like stuck in your mind or why do you think you didn't like it more? Maybe um, those are all really great prompts to just um, explore. Yeah. What's going on in your, in your noggin, I guess. What are your favorite kind of movies to watch? Uh, oh gosh. Yeah. I love movies. I think I grew up kind of in the, the golden age of like Netflix DVDs, getting those in the mail mm -hmm. and just trying to watch one every day so you could send back the other one. But Yeah, a lot of just classics like, you know, Chinatown and Fargo. Um, I love Fargo. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, just anytime you have kind of genre cinema at, at um, and somebody, a director who really knows what they're doing, takes genre cinema and, and presents it in a really specific way, I think is really exciting. I love like Slice of Life, like Mike Lee films, Life, Life is Sweet, or um, Corey Ada films, like you know, shoplifters or nobody knows or afterlife, um, kind of Kelly Reichardt movies. She made this movie called old joy. That's really, this really simple story about two old friends going camping that there's so much like unsaid in it. That's really interesting. Or, um, yeah, like Sarah Polly films, really cool. Like stories we tell or take this waltz. I'm just kind of, I, oh gosh, I love movies. What do I do? <laughs> that's so cool. That's a good problem that's to have. So Yeah, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. It, so you're more of a movie person than a TV person, you would say, right? I think so. I think that's just what I I grew up um watching a lot, but I, you know, I love TV now and it's all kind of the same now in a in a weird way. It's all it's all content, you know. Yeah, I was thinking I was thinking kind of like of like probably more like the pacing I feel like You know, when you're trying to make a movie, you, you have such a short amount of time and like a full, like beginning, middle and end arc for, for like at least the main character and then maybe the other, maybe the surrounding cast as well, um, compared to like a TV where it, show where it can like run for like six seasons, right? And then, and then the arc, and sometimes it's like multiple arcs. So it's like, like, you know how it's like that, like the relationship is with the storytelling is different in that way, I guess, like maybe. Yeah. I mean, TV shows kind of stay the same and, and movies kind of change. Yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. Characters and movies usually change. And, um, in TV, it's about kind of perpetuating mm -hmm. this, this like feeling over and over again, I guess. Mm. Um, but it's really cool to see where they overlap and I could go on forever. So you should stop. <laughs> stop. <me. laughs> 
I love that though. Uh, I love that though. I don't know. I yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask you more about it, but it it's true that we do have a, a lot of like really cool questions from our listeners. So I'm gonna try to do a little bit of a blend of like questions from our listeners and like see where the conversation takes us. I was gonna ask this question from Twitter by this at Chavistian one. What was the process of coming up with the Funges intro? I'm interested because it makes traditional 2D fluid animation with stop motion and live action. Yeah, um, the intro was so fun to do. I, re I really wanted to make it like a 90s kind of intro where the intro is like really good and by comparison kind of makes the rest of the show look even better because you just... That theme song that Simon Panrucker wrote really is amazing. But we did that through um, this director, Benji Brook is his name, who's just an insanely talented cell animator who worked out of New York a lot doing commercials. Um, and he directed that opening. I, I just kind of thumbnailed it out. And he did such an amazing job. He was actually um, the supervising director on Scavenger's Reign, which I don't know mm. if you've had a chance to watch, but it's amazing, amazing on Max. Yeah, it's really um, it's so good. So good. So yeah, he, he took that. And then there were some elements like the mushroom stop motion that we kind of wanted to put in there that I filmed as separate elements. And um, this this planet that I had made out of paper mache way, way back when development started on the fungies. And we just kind of put them all together and he was able to do an amazing job um, incorporating all these different elements. And actually my, my friend, Harry Teitelman, who's the, the main character's voice, he did some animation on the intro as well. He's a really talented animator too. So we just kind of lucked out that um, all these amazing animators could work on the intro, which is cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh my gosh. I, 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 um, yeah. I'm really fond of show intros. Like I, there's a special place in my heart for them. And I, th I, th I do think that they're getting shorter and shorter in a lot of cases. Um, but I really do like, like that, like that theme song that you recognize every time it comes on and like the cool montage of all the characters doing something crazy, the chance to like draw them in maybe even a little bit of a different style or, or do mixed media stuff. Um, I'm a big fan of intros. Uh, do, do you have a, a favorite uh, a favorite show intro uh, outside of um, your own. Yeah. Maybe, uh, thank you for recognizing the fungies. In yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe David the Gnome. Oh, that David the Gnome intro. Maybe that's a little before your time, but it's just a, there's a song about David the Gnome and how um, pure at heart he is. And it's really kind of incredible with all this like footage from the show that you recognize like from clips later. That's a really great one. Uh, just, just all those, those 80 and in, 80s intros and 90s yeah. intros have something really specific going on. That's really cool. Um, Thundercats, you know, that's incredible. That's, that's a beautiful intro right there. What about, what about you, V? Do you, do you have a, do you have a favorite like show intro that you can think of off the top? You know, I don't like, well, the ones I can remember songs, but I don't really remember the animation that goes with it because for me my memory of show intros is like going to my friend's place watching cartoons with her and the goal was to watch pokemon but it was on cartoon network and because i was like a little earlier a little late uh i would watch the cartoons that were around pokemon so i watched um dexter's lab counting chicken yeah uh, Powerpuff Girls. So those are like the intros. All those intros are I so remember. good. All the songs yeah. are amazing. Yeah. You can, yeah. The song stick for with Dexter's Lab is so good. It's <laughs> I, I, but I don't, but see, I don't really, I don't really remember the, the drawings, like what it looked like. I could. So, so for you, it's more of a song thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even yeah. Pokemon, I just mostly remember the, the theme song, not really the, um, what it looks like. Which is kind of funny. Cause yeah. Because we're, like, we're, like, we're artists, so I'm like, oh, I should remember. <laughs> should remember. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I didn't want to call you out. Times. I was like, bad artist, yeah. bad artist. You don't I remember know, right? the art. Yeah, no, I'm just. It's like, not. I've seen this thing a million times, and what I remember is the song. It's funny, but it goes to show how important the song is, you know? Oh, yeah. Even as a kid, I was, I would think, like, oh my gosh, it's some adult's job to, like, sing this song really sincerely. Mm -hmm. That's so, that's crazy. That's, 
Is that embarrassing? I can't imagine doing that <laughs> as an adult. But, um, like for some reason, that's more embarrassing that the... than a regular like stage performance. <laughs> like just a thirty second yeah. song that's so embarrassing. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, it shows what kind of kid I was, I guess. But that was one of the notes when Simon was thing- singing the, the theme song for the Fungies was like, can you can you make it sound even more sincere? You know, um, please, if you can, if you can stand it, when you, just a little more sugary. Yeah, when you say sincere for you, does that mean like with a lot of passion or does it mean like... like cheesy? Like, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, what do you mean? I think just really feeling it and, you know, was it you know singing with your eyes closed kind of you're yes. you're feeling it yeah you know? you're like, you karaoke it's, it's, it's and like, act, had like a it's like acting drinks. acting at the same time <laughs> as you're singing a little bit yeah <laughs> um yeah yeah so yeah i mean all those intros were amazing but it's it's funny to see kind of how that's gone away with streaming and everything and how how they're evolving and stuff um, like i love the idea of an intro that like i like when an intro is like giving you the 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 10 second elevator pitch for like and then they ended up at the bottom of the sea and then, like 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 with the song <laughs> yes. like, i kind of like that i like the idea of being able i mean i know uh you know an- anime does that a lot because the the plots are so complex that they need you to like start you with something <laughs> but uh yeah yeah I mean, Isn't it nice to know exactly what's going on? Yes. Yeah, right now when this. But then again, anime has some of the like, like most I, uh, like I, I can remember some anime intros like uh, Vision of Escaflown because like the poses, like the characters are so dramatic. It's very, it's oftentimes very kind of ethereal. Like, oh, I'm gonna look sad and or like look at the horizon you know what i mean but it's not so story driven <laughs> yeah so it's like just like a bunch of like really pretty pictures which is really funny to me it's like oh, i was like or you're really showcasing the characters it's almost like a music video almost like those anime intros yeah <laughs> i can only ask more questions from the listeners because some of them are like really yeah let's do it cool i like that one from snail hearts on instagram who asked if you have any advice for drawing out ideas and not worry, not worrying about perfection while doing. Yeah. I'll tell you what I did is I switched to a 0.9 millimeter mechanical pencil with a really good eraser. And if you don't like it, just erase it and start over. And um, I don't know why that kind of helped just, just maybe drawing with a different pencil sometimes helps. Um, yeah, you just got to get the idea down in a way that's like you can explain it to a friend and they can understand um, what what you're trying to get across, I guess. Um, I don't know if that's a good answer, really. I like that you started with the tool because I feel like, yeah, depending on the tool that you use, it, it sometimes can really unlock some stuff, like artistically. I feel like as an artist, you don't really draw the same kind of pictures with a pencil than you would with like a sharpie <laughs> mm-hmm. just because of the tool yeah whatever's going to get you kind of in a in a flow state of just making sure the ideas are are coming out i think go for it yeah and the 0.9 millimeter too is like pretty pretty thick right it's like a pretty yeah. large uh oh yeah some 2b lead that's great you're no problems <laughs> i also like that you didn't take that question a type of way and, and and say what do you mean my drawings aren't perfect what do you mean I, i'm just so okay with I'm just not... not doing perfect drawings what do you mean my drawings aren't perfect <laughs> i'm uh, i'm well aware i'm well aware you know no and no just, yeah whatever whatever gets the idea across you know it's all good but it's 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 funny because i don't know i think the art in your comics is so what's the word it's not it's not that it's precise but like the expressions like i don't know i feel like it what you're conveying is like very i don't have a better word than precise but like you know the expressions are very simple but at the same time like um specific you know and like and you have like and the perspective is also simple but always um you're you're i don't i don't have a feeling of your comics being like flat drawings you know like there's always like subtle little camera angles and stuff to kind of accentuate what your your storytelling so it's it it looks easy but it's also i can tell that it's very 
expertly done. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. I was like, <laughs> I'm looking for I can tell that it's very, it's deliberate, very naive. Very, no, the, um, yeah, it's um, you know, it's it doesn't like it feels like it. Nothing is up to chance. Like it's you're. I feel like I'm really getting what you are trying to do when I look at your drawings. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I'd say that kind of goes with comics and seeing how much can you simplify, how much can you, how much do you want to simplify? Um, does it, does any of this matter? Is it all just about the story? Or um, I'm not sure, but it's just nice to have a little assignment where you can just say, "Hey, I'm just going to make this panel look as good as possible in in what's a reasonable amount of time." I guess that's not obscene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. I feel like, yeah, oh, man, sometimes it's so easy to get wrapped up into making a yeah. perfect drawing and then you spend a, mi a million hours. And... So this is this is something that I've been asked recently. And so I'm curious about what you'd say about it. Um, a lot of new artists, you know, they, they graduate school and they're still developing their style. But sometimes, you know, they get torn in between, like as you're adapting to each show that you go on to you're you're adapting to that style which is in your own style you're jumping around and your style you know as an animator sometimes uh becomes a little bit of a chameleon what was it like for you developing your own voice and style drawing wise where you're like you know you're working on these other shows but then when you come back to your own drawings you're like this is how i draw um just for, you know, people that are thinking about that and learning. Yeah, I think that, you know, they always told me at Blue Sky, hey, your stuff is too flat, your stuff is too TV. So I really tried to understand perspective better and get an idea of like the camera and, and how it works. And um, I I just think that it's important to still build, you know, on craft and to use those tools so you can know you know, when can you break perspective or when can you push it to heighten the emotional point of the story um, to, to not disregard those things just because they're, they're hard, but to find a way to like kind of make them work for you so you can kind of hint at them. I, I was always really fascinated by the way like Charles Schultz would kind of draw things from a kid perspective and the idea that you might show like a little bit of the bottom of the desk mm -hmm. in a classroom and stuff um, because that's, you know, the that's where a kid's eye level is that they're going to just kind of look and see the underside of the desk yeah. a little bit. And that means you're going to see like gum under there and all these <laughs> other little details that you might miss if you're just, um, you know, shooting everything with the horizon here and all the, the vanishing points going right there. Yeah. Unless that's like the point of the shot. That's how Rugrats um, felt too. I think a lot, like it made mm -hmm. everything feel oh, big. Oh, yeah. Like you were exploring like a, what is a normal space to you and me. Is like you're a little guy yeah. exploring the nooks in between, the little cranny. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think that everybody, every, um, everybody who who sees that really understands what's happening. But I think it's definitely an intentional choice, and you gotta, you gotta do it just to make sure that people will even be like subliminally aware of it. I guess. Mm -hmm. Um. And in, but yeah, you just gotta you gotta practice. I don't know. In that vein of uh, you gotta practice and like advice um, for a young artist, uh, Scott Pilgrim fan, two thousand six asked, "What what advice would you give for young artists?" <laughs> for young artists, um, I heard this somewhere. I don't remember who said it, but it was like, draw from life a third of the time, you know, copy from really good work a third of the time and then just kind of doodle a third of the time is I, th I think a really nice um, guide to follow. I really like for storyboards, I really like looking at live action movies and just kind of being able to see how they position the camera. Um, anytime you can like draw from life, I think is just, you will get so much more specific stuff than if you are going to draw from another cartoon and try and copy other cartoons. Um, that's how you get, you know, these really specific expressions is you just kind of look at yourself in a mirror and be like, wow, I, I had no idea I could make such a weird face. <laughs> that's so true. I feel like it's funny because I feel like the more specific you want the expression to be, the the more important it is to have like the mirror or like the self, the smartphone with the camera, you know, and like take a picture because I feel like there's some, what's it called, like wrinkles in that, in your face or like in 
such a specific spot to carry that expression across and that yeah. you know we might not think of as well we draw um that's so that's so cool i love that and, breakdown yeah. too the life like drawing from life copying because it man it took me so long in my artist journey to um start copying work that i liked i used to be so scared of copying like work that i like because i was like oh i'm just i'm gonna be uh a like a copycat people are gonna call me out <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah yeah i mean as long as it's i think not everything you draw needs to go on instagram or social media either yeah. it's okay to have a lot of drawing that's just for yourself and you gotta you know it's like exercise you just gotta i mean i imagine it is you just gotta put in the reps and um do a lot of drawing before you come to, to something that might be good. Great advice. I, I like um, to think about if drawing were like bodybuilding, I wonder how strong I'd be. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I want, like if there was like one of those punching machines that you see on like the boardwalk or something that gives you a number for how hard your punch is. I wonder how hard yeah. my drawing punch is compared to other, you know, like. I don't know. That, I think pretty yeah. up there. Looking at your drawings tonight, I would say, yeah, over, over 9,000 for sure. Thanks, dude. <laughs> That's a good number. <laughs> were, were there any other questions, V, that, yeah. that people had? I don't want to miss anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's. I like that one from Eyelid Montag. Did becoming a parent change your relationship or approach to art in ways you didn't expect? Um, I think, I think there's just a lot less time. So you need to be a little more intentional with, with everything you do. And it's just, you just can't stay up late or do anything fun anymore. You just have to know, like, I have two hours, I have to finish all my work and you get it done. And it's in some ways easier to compartmentalize everything because, you know, you just got to get your work done and, um, be there for your, for your kiddo and stuff. Not that it's going to help you get more done also. You know. Do you recommend for young artists having a kid so they become better at time management? <laughs> It'll solve everything. Oh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Please. <laughs> no, don't. That's that's a joke. Yeah, it's, a joke it's, like, it's, it's a perfect life hack. Some, it's good. <laughs> sometimes we're cheeky uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> um... <laughs> I I wonder if you like can be vague about this or maybe like um but um Chivishtian one asked if you he asked any hints of a second project at another network. I think a way we can ask this question is are you maybe thinking of like new ideas or thinking of new projects and are you like working on them actively or are you just kind of waiting what am i doing yeah what am i doing what are gosh you doing, um, <laughs> what am i doing what am i doing well i will tell you um i think that everything i worked on last year was canceled or was kind of scrapped in development i went i went back to cartoon network to like produce a feature there that, that ended up kind of getting un greenlit i think and then um i think after that i pitched a couple other things and i just thought oh i, I really want to make a short so i'm actually i'm making a short it's like my midlife crisis and um it's this really heartbreaking but but darkly funny story about um that was first published in the new yorker it's like a, a short memoir that this man wrote about caring for his wife of 50 years and she has she has um parkinson's actually and she's she's medicated in a way that really helps her her symptoms but she gets these really vivid hallucinations that she sees and the man has to he's advised that it doesn't really help to deny that the visions are there so he should just kind of play along and um it's uh it's a really beautiful story you can you can read it on online and I just, I just really want to animate this. I just had a really strong emotional reaction to the piece and thought I would love to make another festival short kind of in the style of, of the man who planted trees with narration. Obviously, like that's a beautiful short film, but I uh, can't do exactly that. But what's something like that to me that, that really um, has a lot of emotion in it and it is just like a beautiful 
heartbreaking story, I guess. So that's something that I've been working on for about a year oh. and um, oh, wow. have an animatic of it. Um, it's 15 minutes long. It's crazy to make a short. It's silly. Um, but especially right now when everything is sort of nothing is really, there's not as, as much development going on. It just makes sense for me to have something that I can just get started on right away when work is slow and say, Hey, this is something I want to do and I can control whether or not it gets made or gets finished. That's awesome. Yeah. I, yeah, that's first, that's really awesome. And second, I, I really agree with like, and that's kind of what I was telling my agent. I was like, well, if 2023 is going to be this weird year where nothing happens, I'm like, I might as well just be creating. Just incubate uh, some ideas. And... Right? Yeah. Because I feel like if nothing's happening, then it's the best time to create stuff, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's been so fun to just get back to, you realize there are all these skills you learn from your from your jobs that carry over into your personal work. And it's really, it feels really rewarding. So I'm excited about it. It'll take forever and... I don't know, but you just do it one step at a time, Yeah, I guess. Are you going to put it in festivals when it's done? Yeah, that's 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 the plan. Um, I haven't done the whole festival route in a long time, really, since I started kind of doing development stuff professionally. So, who? yeah, who knows what will happen? Um, yeah, it's really cool. I, lo I love these stories. I was just going to say, like, I saw a... Uh, I think it was on TikTok and it was like a nurse who was talking about something similar where she would also play along with like her patients um, hallucinations that were like kind of linked to dementia or whatever. And it was just really, really sweet because like they they kind of formed a, a bond even even through that. I think that's really, I don't mm -hmm. know, it's very touching yeah, emotionally, these kind of stories. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to ask um, when you're working on a project <clears throat> that's your own for that long, I'm curious what you do to still feel confident in it. Because I think a, a problem that a lot of creators have, especially people that are starting out when they start making things that are a little bit longer, is um, they're working on it and then they're like, is this funny anymore or is this good anymore or whatever. How do you feel fresh and confident in it or may, or do you not? And you just keep going anyway. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I take little breaks. It kind of works in sprints more, um, where I'll just work on one phase and get to a point where I have a couple friends and I can show them what I've been working on and get a little bit of feedback. And then, yeah, just take even a week away it really helps to get, uh, some perspective on it. Cause you know, it's going to be it's, it's not, it's, it's definitely like a marathon. So you just got to kind of pace yourself. I, I think it's always better to do a little bit of work every day than to try and get a ton of work done at once. But sometimes there are points where you really want to get to that next stage of production. So you, you know, you work really hard for a couple of days. Um, I don't know. I just know that it won't happen if I don't keep working on it. And I just am really afraid of not finishing it. So you got to keep going. Yeah. It's a battle with yourself. <laughs> To not finish it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so true. I do feel like that uh, is such a big part of, like, the impulse of, like, finishing a project. I don't know. I don't know. This is me being, like, a little crazy here. But I'm, like, sometimes I think about it. I'm, like, I'm like I really want to finish my webcomic, Rodney, before anything happens to me. I have to finish it before something happens. <laughs> Your legacy. Right? Yeah. It's so silly. I... It's, like... Not... I bet that fear is so inspiring too. It you know? is. I'm like, it's, this it's, is it's why primal. I have to. This is the meaning of my life is just finishing this comic, and then when it's over, yes. you make a new one. It's mortality. It's like <laughs> the Grim Reaper something. holding a gun to your yes. head. You know. Yes. <laughs> it's um yeah delightful yeah it's delightful. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Not make stuff? You know. Yeah. It's not even so much about legacy. I don't know. It's it's just like it would be nice to have it be done, you know. And then it's like <laughs> then I can like rest in peace. I don't know. Yeah, take a nap. Take a nap. Exactly. You're never gonna take a nap. <laughs> You're never gonna take a nap. You're never gonna rest. You're just gonna keep going. This one's kind of interesting to trade, Rod. 117 asks from Instagram if you could back if you could go back five years and give yourself any piece of of industry advice what would it be uh just have fun while it lasts you know? 
No, I, I, I think I, I spent a lot of time just worrying about the schedules and everything. We were always very on schedule and, um, yeah, you know, I wish I had taken the time to enjoy it just a little bit more. Maybe there was always so much work to do. So, yeah, just really focus on the drawing and focus on the craft and kind of the the rest will come. You just got to stick with it and be patient. Yeah, patience is it's so true. I feel like it's yeah, patience is really like the word because I feel like it's so easy to get frustrated with with like one's like skills or abilities or like the the, the process or like how fast things are getting done yeah patience is such a, yeah really is such yeah a... everybody's on their own timeline and and um yeah everybody's different so it's different for everybody i think this one is really fun because we touched on wonder pets a tiny bit in the podcast but uh, our patron crass is asking what was it like working on wonder pets oh my gosh those songs are gonna be in my head forever <laughs> the like you know, save the platypus, save the what's going to work, teamwork, uh, all the catchphrases. I would just hear like the same eight seconds of, of music for like a whole day while I animated the scene. I would just like render it out repeatedly. And um, what was it like? What was it like? I think it, I think my brain was destroyed and then rebuilt again. That was fun. It was like, you just sing along with it and dance out some dance moves, animate some stuff, you know. That's so funny. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, man, animating to sound—that's crazy. I, you, I feel just like replaying the same thing over and over and over and over again to, to work on those yeah. few yeah. scenes and test it, and you just like the scrubbing through audio is 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 yes. enough to drive anybody insane. Like like I've had like not even songs stuck in my head, just like a sentence stuck in my head for like just the yeah. way that they say it like uh rhythmically or whatever um <laughs> yes i i actually i love the studio was like down in the seaport in new york it was really fun to just skateboard to work every day in the summer and everything and um go eat a sandwich on the pier and stuff so that that part was fun and it was great just to have a job you know as a kid so i feel very lucky i like that image of you having your sandwich on the pier that's like very romantic <laughs> Um, thanks thanks <laughs> our patron ajax the abrasive asked so are you are you a teacher do you teach um i do i i'm teaching this semester um i'm filling in for my friend fran kraus i'm i'm teaching two um film workshops at cal arts on um fridays it's like uh third and fourth years they're, ma they're making their shorts and um yeah they're making their shorts this this semester and it's awesome they just come in they're making shorts. I'm making a short. They come in, screen their animatic. We we give each other feedback, give each other notes, and then they kind of make up their own assignment for the next week. And then they'll go on next semester to to complete those films as as part of their yeah their yearly student films. So it's it's been a blast to get back into the classroom, and that's always where I felt like the happiest in school, just making shorts. It's so fun. Yeah. Oh man, it sounds so fun. Have you, so a Ajax is asking if you've noticed a new trend, like example, like for example, like, do you feel like the students are making more creator type driven, like, like more like pilots or like more like feature style or like what's, how would you experimental, like the breadth? Artsy, yeah, like what, yeah. what's the trends right now? Yeah, I I feel like everybody is making deeply personal films and some people want to focus more on some aspects of the craft like like the storyboarding or the animation and some people get really experimental but it's it's really different for every student I feel mm -hmm. like um so so overall like trends like I couldn't really say I just know at, at CalArts in particular there is such a focus on developing your voice and being being like a like a director i guess with kind of a vision um so that's that's really cool to say i don't know how those films then like go out to live in the world and go viral and everything and lead to show deals and stuff but <laughs> but i know right now it's just a lot of like really thoughtful hard-working students in a classroom nice. in a basement with no windows every friday morning the no windows is so hard <laughs> Like we're here for the cinema. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like living by the sword, and you're like when you don't have a window. 
wonder we we were we were kind of touching on this question a little bit before the podcast and feel free to kind of like address it however you want uh, at Malesco may red is asking the character of pascal in the fungies kind of struck me as somewhat artistic based on the episodes that i've watched an example is, is a gifted artist still leaves at home socially awkward how did you come up with the character and what made you give him these traits yeah we i had never thought of pascal as being on the spectrum i i had thought of him a lot like myself as just this person who's really sensitive and is afraid maybe a little passive aggressive um growing up I'm, i'm glad that the character resonates with people definitely i think there are a lot of different ways to maybe interpret it even that i'm not aware of um growing up in our family like there was always this voice we used there were like four of us kids and it was like it was the voice you used to like disagree with somebody but you didn't want to make them like mad so you'd be like oh you're gonna wear that is that oh is that really how you're gonna handle that situation and just just this attitude of always trying to um like downplay everything and trying not to to be confrontational in any way in in a way that's it's probably unhealthy but that that's sort of where that voice came from and just this idea that this guy is really sensitive and can kind of absorb the emotions of other people around him in a way that's not always to his benefit I guess was kind of where Pascal came from. Um, just sort of like one half of my brain and then maybe maybe Seth is the other half. <laughs> I love that. That's a great I, answer. I love, yeah, that's a great answer. Thanks. And I, I also think that it, it's nice that um, like with, you know, fine art, uh, in a lot of cases, people put, you know, either put themselves onto the characters uh, when they relate to the characters or they things are... Um, left up to interpretation and I, and I think that that's the really beautiful part about cartoons that's almost like how we that's our relationship with emojis like just like when you have a simple you know a simple little guy and you're like oh my god he's doing that emotion that I do or you know the this emotion mm -hmm. that I relate with um you know that's I don't know I think that's a beautiful thing yeah I mean it's fun in comics sometimes to almost draw less expression sometimes mm -hmm. and you you almost read into it more um i love being able to like draw glasses and not not see any reaction and um yeah it just becomes like a weird placeholder for all the things you're feeling i don't know mm -hmm. that's fascinating yeah i i've noticed that with um like the smiley face em emojis how like because there's so little information just two dots and a smile everybody can project onto it um i think that's so interesting i think that's also why so um the adventure time designs are so appealing mm -hmm. to a lot of people because oh, their faces yeah. are so simple yeah almost yeah, leaving yeah. A, an it expression fun to draw almost leaving an expression empty uh leave space for you to fill in your own in your head yeah kind of yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 definitely it's more universal we have this question from instagram from chiwi peppa which is what do you do when you have an art block which is the name of the show which is a question that we ask all of our <laughs> segue guests. there we go <laughs> yeah, yeah thank you chiwi peppa for doing that for me Ali <laughs> and so <laughs> if you do experience like creative block what does it feel like for you and if you do how do you deal with it gosh yeah it's just really hard to get started sometimes and um maybe usually i'm just not really clear on what my objective is like am i trying to sit down and do some real work here or do i just want to come up with ideas or what what phase of this project am i at just how can i break this big thing down into smaller goals am i just trying to brainstorm an idea like a movie idea or a show idea or you know, just get really specific or say i'm just I'm just going to think about anything and it doesn't matter because I've set aside two hours to just write down whatever comes to my head and that's fine if I'm doing that and it leads to something else that's great. It's good to go for walks. Um, sometimes it's nice to put on different shoes, different hat. Uh, I'll try anything, you know, that's so superstitious. This is my like, thinking cap. <laughs> I have... <laughs> I have a watch I put on sometimes that doesn't work. That's just like, oh, it feels nice to wear this watch. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. But just get get drawing. Whatever you can do to get drawing, I think is really mm -hmm. 
is really nice. If you if you want to get writing, like just sit down and type type something that somebody else already wrote. Just start writing. Um, you know, don't plagiarize, but um, just get in the rhythm of stuff. I think is helpful. I think that's so great that you talk about like like writing what somebody else wrote because I do feel I read that in one of the like I was reading this book daily routines of like artists or like philosophers like you know all like the breadth of like creatives and um one of the writers said they would just like retype what they wrote like the last paragraph of what they wrote the day prior and that was enough to kind of get them started because you're just you're just kind of doing the thing you're just like typing yeah. type 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 and you're not thinking about it's i think that's really that's a really cool like little trick that what you said and just yeah just even if it's something that already exists you can just like type it like write it yeah it's really nice to walk away from storyboarding and then know there's something really easy waiting for you when you come back like you've given yourself a really easy shot it's like a reward or something <laughs> get you back into it yes that's so true that's so true sometimes i i do that to get started i just do like i just clean up like a like a close up on on the character's face i'm like okay I can get this one done in like less yeah. than 10 minutes. <laughs> I, I think that's why yeah. a lot of people, both writers and like artists that are like making shows or boards or whatever. So I think that's why a lot of people start writing a, a little bit of a cold open where we're right in the middle of the action. It's both for the viewer, but also like you're putting yourself into the most fun part of the story to get yourself going. And, uh, and I think that that's kind of an interesting technique just to like give yourself the most exciting part to start off or whatever and then it, it'll get you all jazzed up mm. yeah yeah totally there's so much you don't really need to know you know you can just dive right in it's all good i do feel like i do feel like for me what, what has been really hard with writing is kind of like the pacing of a scene i think like getting a scene to feel good and tight and like you know like okay this is an, an an actual scene that moves the plot forward but also has fun little moments so that the characters can shine it has been like such a like process like do you do you do you type out scripts are you mostly like an like an outline kind of guy or do you also type scripts i think yeah i mean on fungies it was all outlines but they were pretty they were pretty tight outlines i'd say that had um we had a great You know, story editor, John McNamee was amazing. Kelsey Abbott was a writer. Um, Rachel Hastings was another writer early on. And I think f for storyboarders, just going in and really giving them something concrete, even if it gets replaced later, but making sure you have those like story turns in the outline is really important, and making sure it's really clear. So yeah, usually it's just outlines and trying to get key images and key like bits of dialogue that are going to lead, you know, one scene to another scene, I think are really important. But it's also really helpful to think about every scene. This is something I, I saw in like a Jim Jarmusch interview, that you try and treat each sequence like its own mini film, mm. so that you're really trying to make sure that, it, that it's interesting, that it's not just like connecting these two set pieces together, that there's a reason that that scene is you know, in the show or the film and that you're going to watch it and be entertained and be like, oh, I would just watch this as a short film on its own. I think, yeah, maybe, maybe that's helpful for writing too. Yeah. I think that's good yeah, advice. Yeah, yeah, That's really good advice. I don't know if I'm answering any of these questions. I think great. I'm just kind of going off I think into, um, they're, they make a lot La of Land sense here. and they're, you're very concise and very well spoken. I think everything makes a lot the of sense. The speeches are showing. Oh. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I like a good short speech, though. That's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Haiku. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Just a haiku, like, it's kind of like yelled, you know, at a crowd. Yeah. I have a, <laughs> I have a dare for you, Sean. Can you make a haiku that announces the end of the show? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> Um, I think I wrote, I wrote one, if that's helpful. I want to hear it. Um, okay, this is this is my haiku for the end of the show, I think. Um, this has been so fun. Let's do it again sometime. 
Bye bye and take care. Wow, that's really good. Not not much in terms of imagery, but um, I hope it I hope it's heartfelt. Yes, it's perfect. It's the perfect haiku. Thanks, to- thanks, thank you so much for having me on the show. This is really fun. Here's my here here's here's mine. All things come to end. Corpse of this podcast, they sprout. Fungi's show ends now. Wow, I think that that's great. My- <laughs> I love it. That's I, amazing. I, I, I I, I'm not gonna lie. I'm I haven't written I haven't written many haikus. So this was you know a a, a fun little experiment for the end of our show. <laughs> And with that, it's the end of this creative vlog. Stephen, thanks for being our guest and sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and congratulations on this amazing podcast that is uh, really fun to listen to. Thank you. And uh, thanks to our listeners too. Follow us on uh, on social media at CRTV Block, where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests. Huge thanks to our editor Clemens for editing the podcast, Marco for helping us produce the show, and Abuka f- for editing our sh- uh, new shorts. Yes. If you love our show, then support us on Patreon. Becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews and access to your Discord community. And another great way you can support the show is to like, subscribe, and comment. It helps us get more ears on the podcast, and this can help us grow, and it uh, helps just as much as being a patron. Uh, Click the link in the description of this episode to check out the Patreon and also Steven's socials. I've been your host, V. And I was Sean at Keep Being Creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye! Bye! (laughs)